Hello and welcome to Going Off presented by Card Kingdom. I am Chris Cornejo, your associate media producer. I'm Hallie, I'm your content manager. And I'm Jordan, I'm your social media manager as well as meme lord. Today we are talking about Kaldheim. There's already a lot. This is technically like the first day of official previews, but we had the semi-preview week about a month ago. So there's a decent amount of cards, and this first day has already seen a bunch of splashy stuff, including the Planeswalkers. First up, Nico Aris, the new Azorius Planeswalker. What do you all think of Nico? I love Love Nico. Nico is rad. They are the athlete because they're a professional athlete from Theros, but they throw javelin, so they're the athlete. I, I also just love that Nico is such like a flexible card. This is like something we've never actually we've we've seen very rarely before. So it's going to be really cool to have the super powerful planeswalker that you can play at different stages of the game and get different uses out of. It's really wild that you've got this three mana planeswalker that can do this but also be like a 17 mana planeswalker in a dumb commander game <laughs> that you can then just start flinging shards at your deck to draw so many cards if you have some kind of weird combo set up. The plus one is also a bit of a game ender if you are managing to like Voltron up something that's ridiculously huge. Then you just play a three mana RS plus him and hit your opponent for 40. The plus one also works well in flicker or blink style commander decks. So you get to hit your opponent with something, draw a card, and then re-buy a enters the battlefield effect. It's, it's pretty nuts the amount of things you can do with this card for how simple the abilities seem. Moving on, we have the first returning planeswalker, Kaya the Inexorable. I love uh, standard removal of just exile any non-land permanent for five mana and still keep your planeswalker around. The ghost form counters are hilarious. It once again plays into the bounce and flicker mechanic that we just saw with Nico. It's also nice insurance over a couple of turns against Rads, just because what are they going to do? And it's not even like you can exile anything, like you have to Terminus or Hollowed Burial or something to actually get rid of the creatures at that point. I do like the fact that the emblem isn't immediately win the game, like some ultimates can be. You have like two turns to try and kill me, otherwise this will eventually win me the game. So the last Planeswalker in the set, we have the Return of Tybalt uh, with Tybalt Cosmic Imposter. And then yes, we know there is something else to this card, but we'll get to that. Speaking of emblems, Tybalt just gives you an emblem. He does just give you an emblem, that's true. <laughs> an emblem, who needs the plus for an emblem just cast the card get an emblem everyone gets emblems tybalt's minus is not quite uh kaya's kaya being white black gets to exile any permanent that is in the land tybalt is red and black so he can't hit enchantments or other things so his minus only kills creatures or artifacts so obviously he's okay. garbage so we should mention the point of that emblem was his plus and also his ultimate, but we'll get to the ultimate. The plus is exile the top card of each player's library. So the each is important. Again, if you are playing in commander, you get even more value out of Tybalt. Can I just say from a flavor perspective that I really appreciate that Tybalt is literally two-faced. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh my. The flavor on this card is incredibly well done. And specifically to the two-faced, it's... The fact that not only is Tybalt good and will probably make quite the splash, Tybalt is the first time we're seeing a modal double face card of a planeswalker and a god. Yeah, Tybalt isn't even the front face of this. The front face of this no. is Valky, God of Lies, two mana, two one. When it enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals their hand. For each opponent exile creature card, they reveal this way until Valky leaves the battlefield. So the Tybalt side of it is a little random. You're getting the card off the top. Valky, you get to look at their hand and pick a creature. So if your opponent dumps their hand before you can play Valky, it's a little less useful. But it's a two drop, so odds are you can play this pretty fast and pick their best creature, either the next thing they were going to play or just whatever their top end is. This is the first round where we have gods that don't really have any kind of death protection, mm -hmm. either just straight up indestructible, not being a creature at a time or having the basically go back into your deck three cards from the top mechanic. It also is interesting that Valky's copy ability, unlike a lot of creature based copies with X mana, like Lazav, doesn't keep that copy ability. It can yeah. only become a copy once. If nothing else, it is a two mana disruption spell on a two one body. We haven't seen all the gods yet. Presumably there's going to be one in each color if they're filling out the cycle because we have one for three colors so far. From the black one, we'll move to the blue one and get our Odin equivalent out of the way with Alrund, God of the Cosmos. 
It very much fits into the blue theme we've been seeing recently of just no maximum hand size, draw lots of cards that we've seen on several high costed, high power blue cards in yeah. recent sets. I, I also really appreciate that the two sides of this card work really well together. The Raven side lets you lets you scry and lets you put Alrund back in your hand so that you can then play him again and get more use out of him. You don't need to choose how you're going to do it or have a separate bounce effect. It'll just take care of itself. It's also nice just to see Haka being the other side of this card. A, thematically appropriate to have one mm -hmm. of Odin's birds here, but it's a two mana, two, three flyer. So if you don't want to get aggressive with the bouncing or you want to wait until you're bouncing, this just shuts down a lot of early air aggression that you'd see in limited decks and in fast to the ground aggro decks because it has three toughness on two mana. It's perfect. Moving on to our next god, we have Halvar, god of battle. At the beginning of combat, you get to move something around for free, whether it's an aura or an enchantment. And whatever gets that aura or enchantment now has double strike. This is pretty sweet. Like I could see a lot of uh, equipment-based commander decks wanting to mm -hmm. use this. Halvar yeah. also is his own equipment on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the fun part of this is that Yet more modal double-faced shenaniganery, and it's very strong equipment. You can just start going on the aggro as soon as you equip that, because you get the plus two, the vigilance, so just keep fighting, and you don't even care that much if your creature dies, because you just get it back. White and blue very much are deciding that flickering is what they want to do with death or exile. I don't know how often I've seen the ability to move auras around, and that's what's really exciting, is the potential of having early game aura aggression on one of your small creatures, and then you stall out in the mid game, then you drop Halvar, and you can just move that aura around to one of your bigger creatures and suddenly have a lot bigger of a threat. Now we're gonna kinda get into the various mechanics that have been spoiled so far, starting with Boast. It is a effect attached to a creature that you can activate at any time as long as the creature has attacked this turn. Once per turn, that is important, once per turn. Because of this first card we're going to talk about, Varagoth, Blood Sky Sire. It, it's a tutor. It's a vamp tutor. It is. On a stick. I mean, it, it also says target player, so you don't have to target yourself. If you're in a commander game and someone at the table is just going off, they're about to win, and you know you don't have any cards in your library that can deal with it, you can have your opponent, you can have someone else at the table tutor mm -hmm. up a card with Varagoth and have them deal with it. Moving on to uh, the other me new mechanic that they have spoiled so far, we have Fortell. You have a card with Fortell in your hand at any time during your turn. You can pay two mana and exile that card from your hand face down. After that point, you can, at any time that you could normally cast that card, you could cast it for its Fortell cost instead. A lot of them are costed in a way where you aren't really getting a discount, you're just kind of paying the mana in installments. Seraph's Packmate will take his very basic example of Fortell. It's normally a four mana, three, three which is fine when it enters the battlefield to draw a card. Great. You can foretell it for two mana on your second turn and then play it on your third turn for two mana. So you're still paying all four mana, but you're getting it turn three. Such a good doggo. I'm going to draft so many of these. This is a prime example of foretell really sets up a lot of great tempo plays where, yeah, you're not getting a discount on the mana. And in some foretell cards, you're paying more overall for your effect, but you don't need to do it all in one turn. This way you can save a combat trick, have a second spell, or just miss a land drop, that's okay. My next two, my next turn, even though I only have two mana, I can still get a 3-3, three, three, draw a card, hopefully get a, a land. Uh, speaking of cards that cost more if you technically foretell them, we're going to go to the big flashy one so far, which is Alrin's Epiphany. Time Squawk. Time Squawk. There we go. Time Squawk. Thanks, DC New. Oh, it's great. Time squawk. It's great. Those are the new mechanics, Boast and Foretell. We do have some returning mechanics, including Saga, and this is my favorite art in the set so far, Binding the Old Gods. Uh, that art is yes. not a painting. That is an actual sculpture onto a piece of mahogany. You've got a four mana removal spell that hits anything. You get a little bit of ramp and then a very aggro death touch swing for your creatures afterwards. But the oldest school mechanic returning in this set is Snow. Snowlands are back including snow duels. These snow duels have land types on them. And we got a snow instant revealed today in the form of Frostbite. It loses a little bit of the viability in a very fast mono red deck by not being able to hit players, but we're probably never gonna see Lightning Bolt in a standard set again, as far as I can tell. So I'm not mad to see this. What this takes the place of is something like Scred in standard. If you have a small aggressive deck that is just trying to get under some things, it'll clear the way. Now we just have a couple of grab bag ones, stuff that didn't fit into our other categories, like Vorinclex, Monstrous Raider. 
which has some right. some implications to it. <laughs> right. Like, what is Vorinclex doing here? We haven't seen Phyrexians in a little while. This one uh, does not seem quite as immediately grown worthy as far as the game yeah, doesn't just it, end. If they have a single plus one plus one counter going on something, no, they don't. It's real mm -hmm. mean that way. <laughs> if they have a planeswalker with a plus one ability, it's not getting a counter. It's just getting zero. And it's a six mana, six, six with trample and haste. This fits in every big green deck that I want to play. Oh, I want to play this card so badly. Toski, bearer of secrets. How many, how many green cards have we talked about so far that draw cards or generate card advantage in some way? Like green has so many ways to do that now. It's really satisfying to see this card <laughs> from a flavor perspective as well. I am not even going to try to pronounce the name <laughs> of the actual legendary squirrel in Norse mythology because I will just butcher it. But the fact that they made said squirrel into a pretty rad creature card <laughs> as a named character on this plane, that's very satisfying. They are checking a lot of boxes with using the Norse influences in their magic card creation. I do feel like can't be countered and indestructible is a bit of a mean combination of abilities. I mean, it's fine. It's a 1-1 one, one on its own. It's not the worst thing in the world for you. Just Voltron it. Boros doesn't get a lot of great commanders. I don't know that Cole the Forge Master is going to be a great commander, but he fits right into what Boros wants to do. So it hits both token and non-token creatures that uh, like enchantment or equipment. And I feel like the returning creatures to your owner's hand is a thing that Boros really wants to be doing in commander. Just reusing your resources as much as you can. Because those are two colors that have trouble keeping up resource-wise with every other color in Commander. White has a little bit of recursion, but red really doesn't. So having the ability to add that to red's toolbox in Commander is pretty nice. Plus, this is this is like best friends with Halvar. Just oh, yes. Get, get this card and Halvar together and have a party. Skull Clamp. <laughs> Skull Ooh. Clamp and Cold Forge Master are good friends with something like, I don't know, Mem Knight? That will do it for this week. We're going to be doing this again next week and the week after to discuss all of the spoilers as they come out. For now, I've been Chris. I've been Hallie. I've been Jordan, and I will be memeing all of these on Cartoon Social Media. Yes, yes, he will. Thanks for joining Thanks. us, everybody, and we'll see you next week.